So Anurag is a manager at Incident Response Consulting Service at CrowdStrike, and um, he's a really a seasoned speaker. He has given a lot of talks uh, at SANS and at, at uh, DEF CON and other uh, Black Hats and other um, conferences as well. So I am very excited for him to get started. So Anurag, please go ahead. Hey everyone, uh, thanks Max for uh, the introduction and uh, welcome everyone. This is Bartling Ransomware, Ransomware Preparation, Containment and Recovery Strategies. As Maxim said, uh, my name is Anurag. Uh, I work as a manager with the CrowdStrike Services team here in Singapore where I do instant response. So battling those threat actors when they are inside uh, organizations, there is threat actor activity helping them eradicate the threat from the environment. I'm also a SANS community instructor and today, for next 30 minutes, we are going to talk about ransomware. We'll talk about how ransomware attacks work, how threat actors go about targeting an organization, getting the toehold, moving laterally inside the organization, and then deploying ransomware in them. What I would also talk about is how we as defenders can pre prepare against these attacks, how we can mount a response when these attacks are ongoing in the, ongoing in the environment, there is ongoing threat actor activity, or there's an imminent threat of infection in the environment. At the end of the talk, I would like you to walk away from here with a better understanding of how ransomware attacks work and how as defenders we can mount an effective response uh, before such an attack happens and as well as when something like this is happening in the environment. Ransomware attacks are a little different than our traditional attacks which we have seen. The threat actor gains privilege in the environment, gains an excess, elevates privileges, and instead of remaining and maintaining the covert long-term excess and exfiltrating data slowly, in this specific case, the threat actor destroys the backups, steals the data with the aim of extracting the victim, and then deploys ransomware. This all happens very quickly, and this is a very successful business model. At least in the last couple of years, we have seen a threat actor who is very good at what they're doing and making a lot of money out of this. When I was looking to put a talk together for this summit, ransomware was the obvious choice. Ransomware has kept all of us blue teamers, IR folks busy for last couple of years. A lot of IR teams have been burnt down by ransomware attacks which keep on happening. And ransomware is a business problem. When ransomware attacks happen on organizations, we see all these departments and teams coming together. We see leadership, IT, business, finance, public relations, they all come together to mount an effective response to a problem like ransomware. Today we are going to talk about a technical response to this problem. We're going to talk through how threat actors do this and what we as defenders can do. We'll talk through several techniques of how defenders can stop these threat actors. While I'm talking through those, there'll be things which when done in an environment will break stuff. So applications may do go down, users may not be able to access the applications which they usually do. When that happens, especially with an imminent threat of threat actor activity or imminent threat of deployment of ransomware, that's okay. It's okay for some users not to be able to do what they are supposed to do or some applications to go down, especially when there's an imminent threat of ransomware deployment in the organization. Also, let me warn you, this talk is fast paced. There's a lot of stuff which I want to share with the community, talk about what we can do when ransomware infections are happening. And that's by design. Sometimes it may look like I'm going very quickly through the slides, but what I've done is I've put a lot of references throughout the slide deck so that if you want to go back, read through the stuff, share the stuff, you can do that. Before we start talking about mounting that effective response against a problem like ransomware, let's spend a couple of minutes and talk about how these ransomware attacks happen. How do threat actors go about infecting systems so typically the ransomware attack starts with a threat actor performing reconnaissance. This is where the threat actor is trying to find the chinks in the armor. They're trying to find that vulnerability, the initial vector which they can exploit to get access inside the environment. Once they have achieved that, 
they go about performing lateral movement and also harvesting and dumping credentials. This is very important stage in this attack life cycle. Often the aim is to gain domain privilege access or some kind of privilege access across the environment. Once the threat actor has gained that, they do two things. They steal data with the aim of performing extraction and they destroy backups with the aim of making it difficult for the organization to recover their data. Once this has been done, the threat actor is then ready to deploy ransomware. A lot of lateral movement happens here, a lot of other techniques are used and ransomware is deployed. Probably on all the systems where they can or at least on critical systems. At this time, all the hard work has been done and now the threat actor is just waiting for the payday. They are waiting to get paid. And as we have seen in the last couple of years, a lot of time they do get paid. So what happened before that ransomware message popped up on your screen? A number of things happened. The threat actor exploited an initial vulnerability, initial vector. They gained access to the environment. They moved around laterally. They elevated their privileges to become domain admins or a privileged access in the environment. Then they stole data, they destroyed backups, and that's when they went ahead and deployed the ransomware in the environment. All these steps that happen before systems get encrypted and before that ransomware message pops up are opportunities for us defenders, for the IR folks, to detect the threat actor, to disrupt their activity, and essentially limit the, the limit what they can do in our environment, limit the losses. And that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna go through each of the steps, what threat actors do when a ransomware attacks happen, and see what we as defenders can do to make their life difficult, to disrupt their activity. Let's start by talking through the first step, which is initial compromise. There are a number of ways how attackers can get those initial compromise. Four ways which I've put here are probably the most common in my experience. So external facing vulnerabilities, exposed RDP, phishing and Trojans and single factor VPN. I'll talk through all these four. External facing vulnerabilities. So we have seen a lot of these pop up in the last couple of years. There have been VPN devices which have been vulnerable. There have been web applications which have been vulnerable. All these have been exploited by threat actors to gain that initial access in the environment. The most effective way of protecting these are to deploy those patches as quickly as they come out and also to remove that attack surface by removing these devices and applications from the internet if they are not needed. Exposed RDP is another way how threat actors gain access. Often the passwords are guessed, credential stuffing is done, the initial foothold is gained. An RDP should never be exposed on the internet. It should always be behind a multi-factor authentication and behind a VPN device. Then phishing and Trojans. There are a lot of things which we can do in, when we are trying to mount a defense against phishing, phishing and Trojans. User awareness is one, we can, uh, we can change the default programs associated with VB and JS files. Uh, email security solutions can do a good job of filtering out some of these attacks. So they are good ways of protecting against phishing and Trojans. And then comes single factor VPN. My advice for that is to ensure that you have multi-factor authentication on any VPN that is exposed on the internet or is accessible from the internet and more importantly, for all the user accounts which can use that VPN. MFA is the cost of doing business on the internet. If you do not have MFA on an external facing service, you are just waiting to get exploited and responding to an incident. There are multiple ways of how hunting can be done for these techniques and I've put some of those in the slide uh, as you can see. Once the threat actor has gained that initial access, they do lateral movement. And I'm gonna to come to lateral movement at, uh, at a later stage. But let's first talk about harvesting credentials. Harvesting credentials is a key step when this attacker workflow happens. Mimikast is often used, proc dump is used to dump LSAS process where the credentials reside and NTDS.dit is stolen. 
attackers focus on this and this is a very important step you know what that makes it that makes it a very good opportunity for us defenders to detect threat actor activity to protect our credentials and to make it difficult for threat actors to gain access to those often when threat actors do this they are looking to gain domain privilege access because that's what they need to deploy that ransomware everywhere i'm going to talk through both domain privilege access or domain credentials as well as local credentials and how we can protect those when i'm talking about domain privilege accounts a lot of people think of it as domain admins so domain admins is just one built in functional group inside the domain which holds privilege accounts there are a lot of other built in function built in groups in a domain controller like the enterprise admin administrator schema admins and a lot of others who often have either similar access to what domain admins have or sometimes even more access or they yield even more power than the domain uh, admins do another effective way of protecting these credentials and making it difficult for threat actors to get access to those is to use the protected user security group now to do to use protected sec user security group you need to have a windows server 2012 r2 or newer domain functional level what this group does is it implements some non configurable security controls over members of the protected user security group which makes it very difficult for threat actors to then gain access to credentials of users who are part of this protected user security group now both these controls are done best in preparation but even when you have ongoing threat actor activity a imminent threat of ransomware deployment these do work at the time of incident rotating credentials disabling account removing privileges often disrupt the threat actor the threat actor is often not able to accomplish what they are trying to do with ease so all these are good effective control even when there is ongoing threat actor activity in the environment another very effective way and what microsoft recommends is to use what microsoft called the tiered admin model in case of tiered admin model the entire domain infra is divided into three parts there's tier 0 where your domain controllers and adfs servers and domain wide identity resides and then there is tier 1 and tier 2 tier 1 is all your enterprise application servers and tier 2 is all your user workstations the idea here is to limit privileged accounts from logging in only on tier 0 and so on now this takes a while to implement it takes a lot of resources it takes time it takes effort to get it right what i'm recommending here is at least you implement that tier 0 or at minimum you limit where your domain admins can be used domain admins should only be able to log in on tier 0 machines which should be protected so your domain controllers your adfs and your other identity systems this protects those credentials which the threat actor is after now this can be implemented by using group policy and other log on write restrictions now that's good for domain accounts a lot of times how threat actors get hold of these credentials are when these accounts are used for remote administration a couple of ways of how you can secure remote administration is by using remote credential guard and the restricted admin mode in case of remote credential guard what happens is when a source system is used to log in into the destination server the credentials are not left on the destination system the credentials are not in the memory credentials or hashes are not in the memory of the destination system and if someone who's logged into this machine needs to go out and access other machines they need to go back to this source machine and request for a tgs and then they can access it this secures those credentials which are being used to log in into the destination server the other effective control is to use restricted admin mode and restricted admin wo mode works best in help desk admin kind of scenarios this is where a uh, administrator is logging into an end user workstation and helping them implement uh, deploy a software or do some activity in this specific case the user logs in in context of the system which is a destination machine and the credentials are never sent to the destination machine the help desk admin or the user who is trying to log in needs to have admin access on this machine in this specific case 
Now that's about domain credentials. Local admin accounts are other things which are very sought after by threat actors. Often these are used as stepping stones to get that domain privilege and sometimes they are even used to deploy ransomware across the environment or at least on a fleet of systems where common local accounts are being used. Microsoft has a solution called LAPS, Local Administrator Password Solution. In this case, every account has, every local admin account has a different password and that password is stored in the domain controller which can then be accessed. And these passwords, they, which are stored in domain controllers, are then secured using DACLs or discretionary access control list. LAPS is done best in preparation phase. In case there is ongoing threat actor activity and you're trying to mount an effective response, there's this specific SID, S15114, anti-authority local account and member of administrator group. This contains all the accounts which have admin access, the local admin access on an endpoint. So as defenders, what we can do is we can limit the rights of this specific group from logging over the network. Once that is done, even when the threat actor would be able to get those hashes for local admin, they'll not be able to use that to come over the network and access these machines in a way making those hashes which they have dumped for local admin useless. Often threat actors would dump these credentials from the local security authority subsystem, the LSS process. Now there are a couple of ways how we can limit that and, and try to secure that from threat actors capabilities to dump those credentials. We can run this, protect in, this process in protected mode, which then requires any plugin that is accessing the LSA or loaded into the LSA to be digital signed with a Microsoft signature. Other way to do this is to use credential guard. That's using virtualization based security. When this is implemented, there are two LSS processes running in a system. There is the LSS, the original LSS, and there is another process called the LSA ISO. The credentials are now in LSA ISO. And if LSS needs to access the credentials from LSA ISO, it needs to go through this hypervisor, hence virtualization based security. The challenge here is there are specific hardware requirements around deploying virtualization based security. So both these controls are done best when they are done as part of preparation phase. Said that once the threat actor has elevated those credentials, has gained domain privilege access, they again start moving laterally, accessing other systems. And I'll come to that point. But let's first talk about two very critical steps in this skill chain, in this attacker workflow, which make ransomware attacks, ransomware attacks. Stealing of data and destroying of backups. Stealing of data often goes through a specific workflow. The threat actor accesses a lot of systems, systems that have critical data, they copy that data, they compress that data, and then they exfiltrate that data. That compression is often done using utilities like 7-zip, RAR, ZIP, and the exfiltration is done using cloud applications sometimes like Megasync, pCloud, utilities like FTP, SFTP, WinSCP, and also threat actors have often seen using remote management tools. Now these remote management tools, while they have management access or capability to manage a system, they also have functionality for a threat actor to upload data. So these are often used. So it's a good idea to keep looking for these, especially if you have an EDR kind of solution in the environment. And if you identify these, start an instant response process or mount a response to that. This is probably the last opportunity where we can effectively limit what the threat actor can do in the environment. Once the threat actor has performed data theft, ex exfiltrated data with the view of performing extortion, they go ahead and destroy backups. This is very critical from a defensive point of view because if organizations have backups, they don't need to pay threat actor. They don't need the decryption keys. And almost all the times it is easier to recover from a backup than it is to recover by getting a decryption key from a threat actor, even if you can get that. So secure your backups. One way of securing the backups is to have offline backups. Other way is to have backups which are write once, read many. 
So there is no way a threat actor can either gain access to your backups or to destroy the backups which you have created. Now this takes me to one of the most important aspects again, that's the lateral movement which we have been talking about and deployment of ransomware. A number of ways are used to perform this specific lateral movement and ransomware deployment. Often threat actors gain access to one machine and they use that one machine to jump to other systems in the environment and push ransomware. That's because a lot of networks are flat. What we can do is we can create segmentations in the network. We can segment the endpoints. We can limit all these services like SMB, RDP, WMI, WinRM, which are often open by default. They're often listening by default on Windows machines. One way to do that is by using a Windows firewall. So create policies, create a group policy object, put all these rules in, in the group policy and push that group policy out in the environment. Very effective when done at preparation stage as well as when there's ongoing threat actor activity. You would need to create those exceptions when you are deploying this, but it is often easier than a lot of organizations think it is. Another way of limiting what the threat actor can do is by blocking admin shares. Now, admin shares are attackers' favorite. They use admin shares to copy ransomware, to move laterally in the environment. So if you can limit or block those admin shares, disable those admin shares, that limits what a threat actor can do, especially with lateral movement and deployment of ransomware. One way to do that is disable the landman server service, which is running the shares here. Other way is to disable this using registry. Now these commands can be run on the system or they, a group policy can be used to push this out to a large fleet of your systems. One specific utility which needs its own mention because that's how common it is, is PS exec. Now PS exec is a signed utility provide by, provided by Microsoft. The way PS exec, PS exec works is creating a service on the endpoint and then executing that service. While disabling these admin shares will block PS exec, Another way to do that is by creating a fake service. Once you create this fake service called PSEXESVC, even if a threat actor is trying to use PSEXEC to move laterally, the original PSEXEC would not get executed. Instead, something else which you have configured would get executed. A note of caution there is that admin shares and hidden shares will impact availability on systems. So be careful when you are doing something like this and especially don't do this on the domain controllers because that will break the entire domain. Staying with the thought of PS exec, if you know the name of the utility which you want to block, be it PS exec or be it a ransomware named ransomware executable, another option we have is image file execution option, which is creating a debugger. So if you see here, uh, what I've done is created a registry setting and ta and attached psexec svc.exe to notepad.exe. Now on this system, any service or any executable which is named psexe svc.exe when executed will result in notepad getting executed instead. Now this can be done if you know the name of the executable which you want to block. Another way of blocking executable is application control. Application control again done best in preparation, but you can always put application control in the environment uh, with the default rules on. It will break stuff, but it will stop a lot of infection happening in the environment, especially when there's ongoing threat actor activity. So this is how you can block if you know the name of the utilities. These are some of the common tools which we see ransomware threat actors use. So I've, I thought it would be a good idea to put it here so that people uh, can go back and refer to some of these. Now, all this is great. Preparation and do this and do that. What do I exactly do when I'm in midst of threat actor activity? When my systems are getting encrypted or there's ongoing threat actor activity and I know ransomware is coming. If you are in midst of ransomware attack, start isolating key systems, especially your backup servers. Isolate them, take them offline, protect them. Isolate at least one domain controller, especially or preferably with the FSMO role. Now, whatever I've talked about, where I said use a group policy object that can be used to make so many changes in the environment, that is not possible if domain controller is down. So we need to protect those that domain controller, take a backup, and make sure that is available when we need it. 
ensure you know your DSRM passwords because that's what you need to recover your domain controllers if that situation comes and start disrupting threat actor activity. Another thing we can do is crank up the protection. So oftentimes organizations have this machine learning, behavioral protection switched off because that results in false positive. This is the time to turn it on. This is a time to accept there will be a few false positive, but it will block a lot of badness, a lot of bad stuff. So these are some things which you can do when you're battling ransomware. What happens when or if you're ransomware? Now, I don't want anyone to ever need to use this slide here. But if that happens, that's not the time to decide do you want to pay or not. That bridge should have already been crossed. That bot battle should have already been won. You need to decide, will you negotiate with the threat actor or not? And if you want to do that, it's advised that you do that through a professional negotiation firm, not on your own. And let me remind everyone again, often or all the time, it is easier to recover from the backups than it is to decrypt systems by getting a decryptor and working with the threat actor. If you were listening to this discussion and you want to take one slide away, that would be the last slide, which is some of the top controls which I can recommend if you want to protect against ransomware. While my slide comes up, let me talk through some of those. If you have not done this yet, if you have not deployed multi-factor authentication, deploy MFA. MFA on all systems, all external facing services for all the user. Limit domain privileges, deprivileged systems, deprivileged users. In a lot of organizations I work with, often there are more domain, domain administrators than they will ever need. So please do that. Ensure you are using local admin passwords. You have LAPs implemented in your organization because that's what threat actors are after. And patch your critical systems, patch them. The last one is ensure you have backups offline or as we talked about, worm backups. Now that's all I had to share. I'll be sticking around in the channel and I'll be happy to have a chat to listen to your thoughts, to answer any questions you may have. So thank you very much everyone for your time today and I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, back to you, Max. Thanks for the opportunity.